And then, of course, Blaine's going to be here in both services next Sunday. And um, I talked to him on the phone a couple weeks ago, and he shared with me the message that he feels that God has for us through him. So it's going to be great. And I really hope that, you, that, you, that you're here. He is a uh, dynamic personality, and you've probably heard me say, and you will see, I, at one point, he was the most sought-after youth, communi youth, youth communicator in, in the nation and built the, min the, the nation's largest youth ministry where every Wednesday night, their youth service had 1,500 students, and it was um, in incredible, and he lost everything, and I want you to see it today, so I'm going to show you, um, it's a more of an extended clip, it's going to be about the third of our message, and it, it's just cool how God works, because in, today we're going to be in Acts chapter 10, and the, pa the, the chapter that we're in today ties right in with the story that we're going to watch, but Blaine's living proof that God can resurrect any life. So I want you to watch this, and then we're going to get into Acts chapter 10. So the first time I was introduced to porn, I was 28 years of age. You know, by this time, I'd been traveling full-time every weekend for two years. And it just wore me out, almost lost feeling even in my soul anymore. And I remember just walking into a hotel room and doing what I would always do. I'd grab the remote, I'd flip channels, and I saw this box on top of the television. And I knew what it was. I mean, I'd seen it in a hundred hotel rooms and I knew it was an adult movie box. So I just got up, hit the red button, started watching all of this pornography. The worst decision that I made that night was, was not hitting the red button. The worst decision was the next decision because I got up, went down to the front desk and I caught the attention of the clerk and I paid for the movie. And the reason I paid for the movie was because I knew that there was a church that was paying for my hotel room and I didn't want them to see that on the bill. It was the beginning of 23 years of covering up red buttons in my life. Bet on a craps table. A drunkard used it to buy some whiskey. There was nothing wrong with the silver dollar, but how it was used uh, in some cases was wrong. And that's the way it is with your body. Your body's a gift of God. It's pure. It's clean. But when you misuse it through the misuse of sex, it becomes destroyed. God wants us to keep our sex lives pure and clean within the confines of marriage. So I encourage you to remember this. God has not changed his moral standards for this generation. Be a man of God. Be a woman of God. Save yourself for your marriage partner. You'll be glad you did. I had one mission in life. All I wanted to do was preach the gospel. It just so impacted me. Like I remember meeting Pastor Willie George and uh, for whatever reason, I still don't know why today, because I'm a Canadian, he's a Texan. He liked me and he kind of took me under his wing and he said, Blaine, we're doing kids ministry. You're doing student ministry. Let's help to develop a student ministry. So we started doing this show called Fire by Night. And it was back in the 80s. It was just like this low budget Saturday Night Live that preached the gospel. I'm Blaine Bartell. Welcome to Fire by Night. It's good to have you with us on the program this month. We're going to be talking on the program about sex, dating, and relationships. And we're, hey, come on, you guys. This is not the end of the program, okay? Save those for the end. It just exploded. Literally from about age 26 to 28, I went from being literally a nobody in America to being asked to speak in churches and conferences and festivals. And so ministry in those couple years began to change for me on some level. There was this celebrity aspect. I mean, when you combine television and speaking in front of audiences of thousands, and it had gone from preaching the gospel just out of the pure joy of it and seeing people come to Christ to slowly seeing, wait a minute, you know, this ministry stuff affords me popularity. It makes my ego feel good. There's big checks, and in the 80s, there was this youth ministry theme, it's better to burn out than rust out. Man, do whatever it takes, be radical, be, be committed. You know, on some level, 
That ministry would eventually become a drug in my life. I would actually live in that secret world for 23 years. I did not tell a soul. Really, the final five years, I knew that there was no way I was ever gonna win. But the house of cards is gonna fall or I'm gonna die. Over the next several years of my life, I began to be two different people. And as long as I came back to, to my, my real world, my family world, and, and the two didn't intersect, I could kind of live with it, feigning myself as a, uh, a single man on a dating sites. I mean, I was doing really, really stupid things. I had made contact, you know, with this, this person, this woman. We go back to her place. Well, long story short, she comes from the back room and she looks at me with this grave anger in her tone, in her face, and she says, I know who you are. And she said, you are either gonna confess to your family, to your church, or I'm going to the Dallas Morning News tomorrow. I knew, I knew, I knew my life was over. I mean, I just, I knew. I'd come to the end of myself. I knew I'd finally, finally destroyed my life. And I knew I was about to destroy my family. I didn't realize how much my sin was going to destroy the people that I loved the most. I'd always thought, well, it's going to destroy me one day. I guess I didn't see the ripple effect. Our church in Dallas that the people who were so broken, like you, you you had all this vision and you were this man and, and the man of God and leading us and now we find out this is who you were and to see their brokenness and their anger and their hurt and their pain. I, I was so distraught. I went and wrote a, a suicide note, left it at my church, walked out into really busy traffic and <laughs> By God's grace, literally within 60 seconds, there were six police cruisers that surrounded me, put me in handcuffs, took me away. The next day I was flying to Phoenix, Arizona, and I was in rehab for 30 days. I mean, I just pour myself into this idea that I've got to recover, I've got to recover, I've got to recover. But at the end of the day, none of that seemed to be working fully. My heart had not changed. By that point, I'd lost my marriage, my boys. I was financially devastated, hanging on by a thread at that point. I remember driving from Kansas City to Tulsa, not really praying, not listening to radio, just as pure quiet. And I heard what I know to be now, the voice of the Holy Spirit at the time I wasn't sure. And I heard this voice say, Blaine, I am not going to give you a recovery. I'm calling you into resurrection. And I had no idea what that meant, but I couldn't stop thinking about it. So I get home and I said, God, you're gonna have to show me what this means. And, and I open up to the story of Lazarus in John 11, and he wanted to communicate to me about what it means to resurrect my life out of sin. Because he said, Blaine, there's nothing to go back to. There is nothing to recover. Really about the next year after I heard that, Jesus just began to take me on this heart journey towards a resurrected life, a new imagination of who I am, who Blaine Bartell is, uh, who Jesus is really, and what he could do in my life. And no lie, absolute truth, in that next year, completely set free. And I don't mean like willpower, man, I finally got, no heart radically changed, new life, new way of thinking. And I say this with utter humility, by God's grace and God's good community, I have not had a relapse, have not had a slip up in that world in, in over 10 years now. Because resurrection really only has one limitation. There, there is no resurrection without death. I didn't want death of my ego. I didn't want death of my chasing after vanity and money and stuff. I had to be willing to put to death 
the old Blaine Bartel, that the Blaine that wanted celebrity, the Blaine that wanted money, the Blaine that had all this pride about who he was. You know, Jesus said, if you want your life, if you really want to find it, you have to lose it. It wasn't about, oh, give me resurrection so I can get back to where I was. It was like, Lord, I'm going to keep bearing this cross. I'm going to keep living for others. I'm going to keep living in simplicity and not be chasing all the things of this world because I want to keep experiencing the joy of your resurrection in my life. You know, nobody's ever too far gone. We say that all the time, don't we? We believe it. Amen. We know that Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. Jesus was raised himself out of the grave. And now the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives in us. Our key scripture for this series is Acts 1.8. After the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will receive power to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the, uh, the ends of the earth. Amen? It's good news. It's for everybody. It was good news for Saul when, when Saul had a resurrection experience on the road to Damascus, and he went from being Saul to being Paul. Last week in Acts 9, we unpacked the story of when Peter walked into a room, had everyone get out of the room, and he raised a little girl named Tabitha from death. I have been so excited to witness what God has done in Blaine and through Blaine over the last several years since his resurrection encounter with Jesus. You see, I didn't know Blaine very well before he fell. I knew of him. I had met him before. In fact, when I was a teenager, I would watch the show Fire by Night. Loved it. Was all about it. If there were, were friends that I wanted to reach, I would invite them over to watch the cheesy Christian Saturday Night Live show, right? Because back then it wasn't cheesy. It was amazing. It was just like he said, it just exploded. And he was sought after and he was speaking all over. And I remember when I was a young youth pastor, I took my core leaders and we drove to Tulsa for one of his one of his conferences for, for youth pastors and leaders. And I, and I received an impartation from him. I followed him. I wanted to, to be like him. And then when I was a youth pastor in Ohio, he left Farba Night and he was traveling on his own doing something called the Young Revival Techno Tour. And as this young youth pastor in Ohio, we packed 300 students, teenagers, into our little building at this little Assembly God Church in Bellevue, Ohio. And I remember going to, to dinner with him afterwards. And he was so quiet. And he was so different than what I had seen on the stage and what I had seen on the, the television. And I, I realized that later in talking to him, that inside he was broken. And he would go and plant a church in Dallas, do a multi-million dollar building campaign, and then he never got to continue leading that church. And I'll never forget when I saw the news broke, because he had always been a hero of mine. The evangelists that I worked for, they were, they were good friends. In fact, when Blaine was let go from fire by night, the man that I worked for, Eastman Curtis, took over. And when this came out in the news that Blaine lost his church in Dallas, that he had been unfaithful, and everything just fell apart. I remember watching and seeing so many people rip him to shreds. I mean, had it been 2022, I mean, he would have been canceled all the way. You know what I'm saying? When you go through seasons of brokenness, you find out who is really with you. You find out if people really love you. And what Blaine found out is a lot of people walked out on him. And he would tell you he, he, he deserved it. But I remember it was kind of like an encounter that we're going to read about in Acts chapter 10. Encounter that Cornelius had with the messenger, an angel. An encounter that Peter had while he was in a, in a vision. 
I had a, a similar encounter when I was just sitting at my computer, and I felt compelled to reach out to him. I sent him a letter, and I said, I said, Blaine, uh, my name is Chuck Tate. You don't know me. We've met before. I had, we had dinner one time years ago when you came to a church that I was leading a youth ministry at, and I work for Eastman. Of course, you know Eastman really well. And, and I just said, man, I want you to know that I love you, and I'm committed to pray for you. If you need anything, man, I'm here. I can see a lot of people have walked away, but I'm willing to walk with you. And he wrote me back, and we began to talk. And next thing you know, Rock Church, we hired him as a consultant, not to do ministry, but to coach us through some leadership principles and church growth principles and strategies, and we began to spend time with him. He was in his restoration process, or he would say his resurrection journey, and he was committed for three to four years not to do pulpit ministry, and he didn't, but he came to Rock Church, and he didn't preach, but he just sat in a service like you're sitting here today, and and we met, and we built and developed a, a friendship, and then he, he ended up stepping back into the church world, and he was serving as an associate pastor at a church in Chicago, and not doing pulpit ministry, but growing the team, and all those things. And then finally, it came time for him to step back into pulpit ministry, where God had completely, not just restored him, but as you'll hear next week, resurrected him. And what's so special about Blaine being here next week is that the very first church that opened its arms to him, the very first church that he preached at after this journey that he was on was right here at Rock Church. So don't miss next week. I know God is going to do something special next Sunday. Amen? I believe that it's a divine appointment, just like we're going to read about today. Acts chapter 10, we want to get right right to it. We only have a few moments. But in Acts chapter 1, verse 1, it's Acts chapter 10, I should say, verse 1, it says, in, in Sisera, there lived a Roman officer. His name was Cornelius. He was the captain of the Italian regiment. He was a devout, God-fearing man, as everyone was in his household. He gave, he gave generously to the poor. He prayed rarely to God. But then one afternoon, about 3 o'clock, he had a vision in which he saw an angel of God coming toward him. Cornelius, Cornelius stared at him in terror. What is it, sir? The angel replied, your prayers and gifts to the poor have been received by God as an offering. Now, let me just stop here for a moment just to remind you that when you pray, God does hear you. Amen? He does see you. And sometimes we serve and we give offerings and we give our time, we give our talent, we give our treasure. Sometimes we feel underappreciated. We feel overlooked. We feel like God doesn't see. This is a great reminder that God does see. Amen. Tap somebody and say, God sees. Right? He hears. He responds. In this moment, Cornelius is assured by this messenger, by this angel, that his prayers and gifts have been received by God as an offering. He said this, Now send men to Joppa and summon a man named Simon Peter. He is staying with Simon, a tanner who lives nearby the seashore. Now, last week when we concluded Acts chapter 9, because we're going through the whole book of Acts, right? And I was calculating this. I don't think we're even going to finish this year. We're, just gonna, we're, we're not going to stop until we're done. We're going to take our time. We're going to go through it because there's so much in the Word. And for the history of Rock Church, I have always been a topical preacher. I pick subjects, and we do topical series, all right? This is what's called expository preaching, where we are taking Scripture, we are taking a book of the Bible and going through it verse by verse. And even if you don't like it, I don't care. I'm loving it, all right? God's word will not return void. Amen? And God is using this angel to deliver this message. In Acts chapter 9, we, we wrapped up last week. Remember where God used Peter to heal a man named Aeneas who had been paralyzed and in pain for eight years. And then God used Peter to resurrect a little girl or a young woman named Tabitha, right? Remember in the Greek, her name was Dorcas. All right, and then she's probably again in heaven saying, please, can we just stop it already? No more Dorcas, right? So I've been given a new name, all right? But anyway, Peter, 
He said, in the name of Jesus, all right, he healed Aeneas, and in the name of Jesus, he raised this little girl from death. Everybody say resurrection, right? And it says last week when we clue that Peter, he was staying in the home of this man named Simon the Tanner, and now God has already set up this divine appointment. He wanted Peter to be there. Now he is sending Cornelius' men to Peter to arrange a meeting between Cornelius and Peter. So Cornelius, he has this vision from God, and God has set this into motion. So as soon as the angel was gone, Cornelius, he sent two of his household servants and a devout soldier, one of his personal tenants, and he told them what had happened, and he sent them to Joppa. So the next day, as Cornelius' messengers were nearing the town, Peter, he went up onto the roof to pray. All right, this is a divine appointment, right? So it was about noon, he was hungry, and while a meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance, all right? Peter has this vision. He has an experience. He has an encounter with God, right? He saw the sky open, and something like a large sheet was let down by its four corners. In the sheet were all sorts of animals, reptiles, and birds. Then a voice said to him, this might be one of my favorite sentences to hear God speak. Get up, Peter, kill and eat them. Right? Take that, all you vegetarians. God right here is saying, eat some meat. It's okay, all right? It's all good. Now, all jokes aside, Peter was committed to never eat anything unclean. So this freaks Peter out. Peter's life, all right, he, he's known to he, he stay away from certain things. But So what does this mean? In fact, here's, here was his response. No, Lord, I have never eaten anything that our Jewish laws have declared impure and unclean. Aren't you glad God's into relationship, not dead religion? Amen? But the voice spoke again. This is powerful. Do not call something unclean if God has made it clean, right? And that go goes for people too. God resurrected Saul. Saul went from being a persecutor of the church to planting churches. Remember what God said when Ananias was afraid to go meet him. He said, Saul is my chosen instrument. Amen. Blaine is my chosen instrument. You are God's chosen instrument. Let me just stop for a second and remind you that God sees you, he loves you, he's the one who created you, and it doesn't matter what you've done. I know some of you, you're embarrassed about some of the things you've done in your past, right? But you are God's chosen instrument. Everybody who's watching today, right? You are God's chosen instrument. Don't allow the enemy to beat you down with guilt and shame. The word is clear. Jesus said, in me, there is no condemnation. Amen. Jesus came to save those who are lost. He came to set you free. He is a God of resurrection. Not just restoration, but resurrection. What does God want to resurrect in your life? Today, we, like last week, get rid of the unbelief, right? Get unbelief out of the room. That's what Peter did, so we can believe God. We have to believe that God is for everyone in this room. He's for everyone watching this live stream, right? Hashtag 4 to 309. He is for everyone on this planet, everyone outside these doors. God is for. He loves. We've been called by him, chosen by him, loved by him. Amen? But God is trying to get this into Peter's head, just like he's trying to get it into ours today. Peter, it says, he was perplexed, right? God said, don't call something unclean if God has made it clean. Verse 16 says, the same vision was repeated three times. Everybody say three times. And then the sheet was suddenly pulled to heaven. Now, we're going to come back to that in a second. But verse 17 says, so Peter was perplexed. What could this vision mean? And as he is pondering this, as he's thinking about this, it says, just then the men sent by Cornelius found Simon's house. Standing outside the gate, they asked if a man named Simon Peter was staying there. All right, see, this was a divine appointment. God had already been moving the previous day, right? Remember, it was 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Now, today, the men are there, and at noon, they're about to show up, 
And Peter just has this experience, this, this encounter with God, this vision where God repeats himself three times. He comes out of that, and then they're at the door, right? I just love that God's always moving. Even when you don't feel like he's moving, I just want you to know, let's stop here and just say, God is moving in your future, amen? He's moving in your life. Don't give up on anybody. Don't give up on your kid. Don't give up on a parent. Don't give up on a coworker or a friend. God is moving. He is big enough, amen, to speak to them, to speak to you, to have your worlds collide. Maybe you don't even know it yet. Just keep trusting God, amen? So, it says this, meanwhile, as Peter was puzzling over the vision, the Holy Spirit said to him, three men have come looking for you. Get up, go downstairs, and go with them without hesitation. I just love, again, there's a message, get up. There's something about getting up and going with God. And here's what God said, don't worry. I'm the one who sent them. So Peter went down, and he said, I'm the man you're looking for. They said, we were sent by Cornelius, a Roman officer. He is a devout and God-fearing man. He's well-respected by all the Jews. A holy angel instructed him to summon you to his house so that you, so that he can hear your message. Now, what is Peter's message? It's the gospel. It's the good news. But we need to remind you that, that Peter and the disciples, they're preaching this message to Jews only. All right? And God is using this whole moment, this whole story, to let Peter know that the gospel is for everyone, right? It's for all races. It's for all people of all times. So because Peter had this experience, he's ready, he's ready to go. So Peter invited the men to stay for the night. The next day he went with them, accompanied by some of the brothers from Joppa. They arrived in Cicero the following day. Cornelius was waiting for them, and he called together his relatives and his close friends. And when Peter entered the home, Cornelius falls at his feet, begins to worship Peter. Peter's like, get up, man. you got to quit doing this, right? He says, I'm human just like you. So Peter told them, you know it is against our laws for a Jewish man, such as Peter, to enter a Gentile home like you, Cornelius, or to even associate with you. So even though it's so interesting to me that Peter and the disciples, they were so um, so set in their ways, right? Still bound by law. Even though they were with Jesus, when Jesus called Zacchaeus and they went to Zacchaeus' home, even when Jesus and all the disciples went to Peter's house and they were hanging out with the prostitutes and all the riffraff and all the religious leaders of that they, they couldn't understand why Jesus would associate with them. And remember what Jesus said, I didn't come for the healthy. I came for the sick. I didn't come for those who think they are righteous. I came for those who know they are sinners. But here, after Jesus has been resurrected, he's commissioned them. Peter has planted the church. The church is spreading, and it's going beyond Jerusalem to Judea and Samaria. But they are focusing only on a select group of people, the Jews. And God is ready to turn the world upside down now to communicate that he came for everyone, for God so loved the world, amen, that he gave his only begotten son. This is for everyone. So here's what Peter says. It's against the Jewish laws for me to associate with you. That's what he says. But God. But God has shown me that I should no longer think of anyone as impure or unclean. Not a priest right there. God has shown me that I should no longer think of anyone as impure or unclean. Who has God placed in your life that you have looked down upon because of some of the things that they've done? Maybe things that he's delivered you from, right? And God loves them as much as he loves us, and he wants to use us to reach people just like he's using Peter to reach this home right here. He says, so I came without objection as soon as I was sent for. Now tell me why you sent for me. Now in verses 30 through 32, Cornelius, he tells him the story. He talks about his encounter. Verse 33 says, so I sent for you at once, and it was good of you to come. Now we're all here waiting before God to hear the message that the Lord has given you. So Peter replied, I see very clearly that God shows no favoritism. 
Yeah, it took three times, remember that. In every nation, he accepts those who fear him and do what is right. In every nation, this is the message of good news for the people of Israel, that there is peace with God through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. And Peter begins to share the gospel. He shares the good news. In verses 37 through 41, he talks about Jesus and how Peter was an eyewitness of Jesus, that he was with them in ministry. He was there for Jesus' death and resurrection and the commission. In verse 42 says, and he ordered us to preach everywhere and to testify that Jesus is the one appointed by God to be the judge of all of the living and the dead. So it's interesting that he says, and and God ordered us to preach everywhere. He had that part right. But he didn't realize God not only wanted him to preach everywhere, but he wanted him to preach to everyone. Right? Not just a select group. He is the one all the prophets testified about, saying that everyone who believes in him will have their sins forgiven through his name. And this is where the man is the gospel. It just explodes right here. Right? It's for everyone who believes, period, right? That is the good news. And that's still our mission. And the Great Commission is still for all of us to go in the world and preach the good news to all people because it brings great joy. The only way that this world can experience great joy is to respond to the good news that is for them. Amen? Praise the Lord. Most of us in this room and watching, we've experienced that. But it's for everybody, right? This is not a club. This is not just for us. It is for the world. Verse 44 says, even as Peter was saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell upon all who were listening to the message. The Jewish believers who came with Peter, they were amazed that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles. They could believe what was happening, for they heard them speaking in other tongues, and they were, they were praising God. See, the, the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is for everyone too. Now, when you get saved, you receive the Holy Spirit. The same Spirit that raised Jesus comes to live within the believer, but then they are baptized in the Holy Spirit. They begin to speak in tongues. So Peter gave orders for them to be baptized in the name of Jesus. So then they got water baptized. They went and publicly professed their faith, and the church from this point on begins to explode, not just to Jews, but to Gentiles, everyone who's not a Jew. It's for everybody. Amen? And today in 2022, the gospel is still a message for all people, for all races, right? It's for everyone. This is why one of our core values is four words, same message, different language. Our tagline for many years we're going to communicate the gospel with love in a way that people understand. The message has never changed. Since Rock Church opened its doors for the first time on May 31st, 1998, the message is still the same. Our methods have changed. Some of our systems have changed. Some of our processes has changed. You date the method, you marry the message. The message does not change. It's still the same message today. We won't walk away from it. We won't dilute it. We won't stray from it. We're not going to dismiss it. We're not going to dismantle it. It is the same message. Everybody say same message. The same message that Jesus loves everyone. It still applies today. God can resurrect anyone. Amen. This is why we can't give up on anybody. Now here's why this story is so significant. Peter, he has this experience. He goes on the roof to pray. And he has this vision. And he sees the sheep coming down with the reptiles, the birds, the animals. And he hears that message. Eat. Nothing that, uh, nothing that you call un unclean is unclean, right? Everything, it's all, it's all good. And here's, here's what's... Um, in other words, what, what, God has, what God has made clean, don't you call it unclean, right? What's so fascinating to me about, about this story is that it was repeated three times. God always knows how to get our attention, doesn't he? 
you remember when Peter told Jesus that he wouldn't deny him? Right? Jesus said, you got to be careful, Peter. The enemy, man, he wants to pounce on you. He wants to take you out. Before the rooster crows, you would deny me not once but three times. Peter said, nope, I won't do it. Did he do it? Yes, he did. And he went, and he wept bitterly. And the reason he went and wept bitterly, because after the third time the rooster crowed, it says that Jesus and him, they locked eyes. And in that moment, he remembered, it says, he remembered the words that Jesus said, you would deny me three times. And his heart was broken, and he left, and he wept, because the disciples still did not truly believe that Jesus was going to come back from death. You find that out after he was raised, that nobody believed it. And Peter, he just went right back to his old way of life. He went right back to being a fisherman. And you remember when Jesus appeared to Mary at the grave, she said, go tell the disciples, and who? And Peter. Go tell Peter, especially Peter. Right? The last time I saw Peter, he didn't look so good. And here's what's, what's great. They did. They went and told him. The disciples didn't believe. So Jesus went to them. Peter was fishing. And what did Jesus do? He cooked breakfast. Blaine was there, I think. No, not really. But no. Jesus, he, he, he cooked breakfast. And Peter, man, he's the disciple that dove out of the boat. And he ran to Jesus. And Jesus embraced him. Do you remember what Jesus did? He said, Peter, do you love me? He said, you know I love you, Lord. He said, feed my ship, sheep. It says, Jesus asked him how many times? Three times. And when you read that story, you see that Peter was offended, wasn't he? He knew what Jesus was doing. Okay, I get it. I said I wouldn't do it. I denied you three times. God resurrected Peter. Remember, Peter's the one who started the church. Peter's the one who preached and 3,000 people got saved. And now God is using Peter. So when Peter has this experience, and Peter is locked in his ways, God gives him the same vision three times. I really believe the reason it was three times, because it was like Jesus was, was saying, I know it will be hard for you, Peter, to believe that this message is coming from me. But this is how I want you to trust me. This is how I want you to love me. This is how I want you to feed my sheep. I'm using this special pattern only for you because only you and I know about it, right? He knew that's what it would take. And Peter responded, didn't he? And the rest is history. The gospel was spread all across the globe. God used Peter. He used Paul, a resurrected Saul. And the enemy has never been able to stop it. And now it's a divine appointment that God has you here today in 2022, still hearing the same message that Peter delivered to Cornelius. The gospel's for everyone. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter who has unfriended you, unfollowed you, blocked you, canceled you. Even some people are at home today because they didn't even feel like coming. They just feel so dirty. The gospel's for you. It's good enough. You may have heard me share several years ago. I remember when, when Deion Sanders got saved. Now, today, he's the, he's the coach of Jackson State. He's turning that program upside down, doing all kinds of good things. And I just watched a video a few days ago of a God who saved his life. Unbelievable. But when he became a Christian, he shared his testimony at the Potter's House in Dallas, Texas, at T.D. Jakes' church. And there were a lot of people that were questioning whether his faith was genuine, whether his salvation experience was real. A lot of people were, were still canceling him out. Like, no, no, I know Dion. He's arrogant. He's this. He's that. And Dion, in his testimony, stood up and said, anyone here today who doesn't believe that I could come to Christ what you're really saying is the blood of Jesus isn't good enough. That a preach, because the blood of Jesus was good enough for Saul. It was good enough for Peter. It was good enough for Cornelius. It was good enough for Blaine. It's good enough for you. Amen? Amen. Can you stand? Jesus, we thank you 
for what you've done. We thank you that today you have assembled us here just to simply be reminded that the good news is for us. The good news is for everyone, including our enemy, because in your kingdom, you turn our enemies into brothers and sisters. So I, t- I pray today, God, that we will expand our love. God, those who have been sucked into legalism, man-made religion, God, we just throw that out today. Forgive us for calling anybody unclean that you made clean. We thank you that everyone in this room and everybody watching is your chosen instrument. So today, we ask you to forgive us. We repent of our sins. Today we place our faith and trust in you. And your word says, we confess you, Jesus, with our mouth. We believe in our heart that you are raised, that we're saved. So we thank you today by faith that we sit here, we stand here saved because your blood is good enough. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen, amen. I'm so glad I came to church today. I hope you are too.